So as a place to begin, and this is uh, one of my pet peeves, let's look at the cooling towers. Let's look at the chiller plant piping. And you might see on the left-hand side of your screen a cooling tower and the cold water piping, the condenser water pump running through the condenser. By the way, uh, blue being cold, red being hot. And that's the part we're going to talk about in the seminar a great deal of our time. On the far right-hand side of your screen, you'll see the load, whether that's a, a chilled water cooling coil or whatever it may be, that's your 45, 55 degree side. That's where you're keeping the owner or the customer in the building happy. Between those two extremes, in the middle, is actually a, a refrigerant cycle. I want to start with the refrigerant cycle because nobody ever really talks about it anymore. And this is the part where you have a compressor, an expansion device, a condenser, and an evaporator that you've got a refrigerant cycle going on inside of. We want to talk about that just a little bit so you understand what impacts the KW on that thing. Where is the operating cost being influenced on a chill? So between the condenser water side and the chill water side is the chiller. Could be a centrifugal water cool chiller, could be a reciprocated chiller, could be a screw machine. We don't care. But let's look at that basic refrigerant cycle as a place to start. Now I like defining a refrigerant very simple. If you know the pressure of a refrigerant, you know the temperature. If you know the temperature of a refrigerant, you know the pressure. That's what it makes it kind of unique. You see all these service guys running around with uh, little tubes and little, uh, and little gauges and sensors. All they're trying to do is they'll hook onto the compressor cycle. If they can get a pressure anywhere, they know the temperature. And, and that's what they're after. They know how well they're working. So let's start with the compressor motor at the bottom of your middle of your slide. So that little blue would be low pressure vapor, low pressure refrigerant vapor gas. And I'm going to, so what I've got on the blue side, on the cold water side of that compressor is this. I have a low temperature, low pressure gas. I'm going to take my compressor and pump it up. I'm going to pump it up to a high pressure, high temperature gas. See how the pressures and the temperatures influence this? So the low side is a low temperature gas. High side is a high temperature gas. And the pressure difference is the key. So the amount of work being done by your centrifugal machine, your reciprocating machine, is how much lift do you have? Just like a pump. How much is the head? What is the lift between the low side and the high side? How much work are you doing there? And that's controlled by the condensing temperature and the evaporating temperature. So coming out of the compressor, we now have a high pressure, high temperature gas going to the condenser. I wonder what a condenser does. Condenser condenses it. It takes the BTUs out of that high pressure, high temperature gas and makes it to a high pressure, high temperature liquid. And those BTUs, 85 degree condenser order, 95 going out, the condenser condenses the liquid transfers the BTUs over to the coolant tower, and the coolant tower rejects the BTUs out in the atmosphere. That's what the coolant tower does. Now I have a high pressure, high temperature liquid, and I go to the expansion device at the top of the slide. And what's an expansion device? It's an orifice, it's an expansion tube, thermostatic valve, some way to reduce the pressure. And what happens when I reduce the pressure? I reduce the temperature. So I'm taking a high pressure, high temperature liquid. I'm going to reduce it to a low pressure, low temperature liquid. Wow, now I've got my cold liquid refrigerant, and I take it to the evaporator. And what does the evaporator do? It takes warm return water, 55 degrees, sucks the BTUs out, takes that low pressure, low temperature liquid refrigerant, and makes it into what? A low pressure, low temperature gas. And coming out of the evaporator, we've got nice 45 degree cold water. Going on to the compressor now, we have a low temperature, low pressure gas and we start the cycle all over again. What I want you to learn, nobody really talks about that basic cycle. That's the same cycle you have on a water source heat pump. It's the same cycle you have on a air cool heat pump at home. It's the same cycle you have on your refrigerator at home. It's the same cycle that's in your car. And everybody involved in this business needs to understand that. And from a cooling tower standpoint, what have you learned? You've learned that that condenser water temperature controls the pressure, temperature and pressure in the same way a refrigerant, and that's the amount of work the compressor's got to do. So wait a minute, maybe by reducing the condensed water temperature a little bit, I might have less KW going to my centrifugal chiller? Absolutely. Those are the things I want you to learn and keep it back in your mind as we go through this, because we've got to look at the energy, and you need to understand the basic 
refrigeration story so you can understand what follows. Now, if we go through this, why have a cooling tower to begin with? And it goes back to refrigerant temperature. It goes back to the work. Very simple. A cooling tower takes latent heat. And, I, and another little simple statement I like to make is if you take a, a pound of water and make it to a pound of steam, it takes a thousand BTUs. You take a pound of condensate at zero and you condense it to, uh, 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 excuse me, a pound of steam, you condense it to a pound of condensate, it's a thousand BTUs. Steam tables might be 980, 960, let's just use a thousand today. So a thousand BTUs will take a pound of water to boil it off. In other words, if I could take some BTUs into my cooling tower, for every pound of water, I could evaporate to water vapor in my tower, I can soak up a thousand BTUs. See, a cooling tower is a late machine. It's not worried so much about the sensible temperature in the atmosphere. It's worried about that wet bulb. It's worried about how much moisture can I put in the air because it's going to evaporate the water at the rate of a thousand BTUs per pound to soak up the energy in the cooling tower. So that's the key thing to learn. So what does it do for a living? It cools water by evaporation. That's a couple of kids, and as kids growing up on the farm down east, when we got hot in the summertime, we did not have air conditioning. But we learned pretty quick, if we put on a bathing suit and went outside and got wet, the evaporative cooler would keep us comfortable. If we still could not get cool enough on a 100 degree day, we did have fans, so we'd wet ourselves down, turn on the fan, and guess what you have? You have the evaporative cooler, thousand BTUs per pound. Your body is now the fill of a cooling tower. You got, got it wet and that's how a cooling tower works. So if you ever doubt how a cooling tower works, just go back to the youth, been outside in a sprinkler, running around, getting wet on a hot day, and you know how a cooling tower works. In fact, on a 100 degree day, getting you wet, turning a fan on you, and controlling the amount of air going by your body, I could make you shiver. I could get you so cold you couldn't stand it on a 100 degree day. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great day.